Please join me in Galatians chapter 5, or 2, excuse me. That was our memory verse. (laughs) Galatians chapter 2, and uh, we'll be looking at verses 17 to 21, looking at those those few verses there. But uh, before that, I I would like to, you notice my my title is The Grace Substitute, and uh, I just couldn't get over the idea of a substitute in our passage as we look at this, uh, this context here. And it made me, uh, it reminded me a little bit of a family history that uh, in, in the Civil War, I don't know if you were aware of this, but in the Civil War, you could actually hire a substitute to go to war for you if you were drafted. And I'm not sure of all the details and whatever, but you could actually pay them. And, and the, the Congress said 300 bucks. Well, Lincoln paid somebody 500 who went to, to war for him, and uh, the, uh, the guy survived, and, uh, and it was, uh, but he did get sick during the war, and he, maybe that shortened his life, but, but uh, in, in my own family, the, uh, the Seekins family, they were nestled in New York, and uh, uh, a guy named Martin was hired by a preacher to go to war for him. You know, darn preacher. <laughs> anyway, and uh, he, he actually got $500 as well. And uh, Martin was on a boat and traveling down the Ohio River from New York area, wherever they gathered, and uh, got down towards Cincinnati, and, and the boiler on the boat blew up and killed him. And uh, he never even, never even got to the war. And, uh, but what's interesting is that as far as the draft board was concerned, as far as the draft board was concerned... Uh, he could, he could, uh, that preacher could say, oh, I got the death certificate. He died in my place. Martin died in my place. And uh, as far as the Seekins family concerned, that $500 wasn't very much. You know, and, uh, but anyway, Christ was my substitute. Christ was my substitute. I didn't have to pay him a dime because it's all by grace. He died on that cross in my place, and it cost me nothing. Oh, it cost him dearly. It cost him dearly, and and, uh, this would be a great time of year to read through through what Christ went through and the the brutality of the crucifixion. It'd be a great time to read that for what Christ did for us. But he died in our place. He was our substitute. And, and everyone today trusting Jesus Christ and him alone uh, if, as, as your substitute, everyone who does that has sins absolutely and perfectly forgiven and has a home in heaven guaranteed. And so what a beautiful picture of Christ being our substitute. And I sure want, sure want to encourage you to make sure your faith is in him and him alone today. Uh, some of our missionaries in, uh, in Paraguay, the, the menors, they've been here a couple of years ago, and uh, they're missionaries that we support. He wrote a letter just this week, we received it, and he said, uh, so many of the people they meet are steeped in religion, and what happens is, he said, so many people we meet have the wrong recipe for the bread of life. That's the way he put it. Because they believe that, and here's his quote, good works are the currency that you can purchase God's forgiveness rather than grace. You know, and that's, that's the sad thing about religion is it ends up in, in putting the cart before the horse. You know, we're saved by grace so that we can live, live, and live out good works. We don't do the good works so that we're saved. That's what religion does. They go backwards. And uh, when we look at, at our context here, that's the battle of Galatians, that the Apostle Paul is saying that there's confusion there in Galatian. These Galatians are confused about what salvation is about, and Peter's hypocritical running away from the table uh, was, uh, was something that portrayed hypocrisy. I mean, he portrayed the wrong message by running away from the table where he'd been eating with the Gentiles. And that's probably still in mind, even though I, I took my post down here that we had for a couple of weeks. Uh, but that's still in mind with what's, what we're going to look at in our context. And so we're going to back up to verse 15 for today and just read from Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. 
we who are Jews by nature. So here's Paul addressing Peter. He says, we Jews uh, and not sinners of the Gentiles. Well, we mentioned that that was, that was the Jewish kind of an attitude. You know, we're not sinners, you know, that, that kind of thing. That's gonna, we're going to peek back at this verse uh, a little later. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore the minister of sin? Certainly not. Or the King James says, God forbid. God forbid that we'd even think that way. Verse 18, for, I, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Ah, that gives us a hint at what 17 even means. And then we have the powerful verses. These, these 19 and 20 are so powerful. I, I feel, I, I just feel I'm just woefully inadequate to even, even preach on these. It, it's just so great. But he says in verse 19, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, but I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I don't frustrate the grace. I don't set aside, or King James, I think, says frustrate. Some might say displace. I don't displace the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Powerful, powerful verses that we have here, but keep the idea of a substitute in mind. Coming back to verses 17 and 18 briefly, uh, my point number one is that Christ is not the source of my sin. When I failed, even when I fail, even though I'm trying to be justified, you know, I, I want to be justified, or I can claim I am justified. When I fail, that doesn't mean that it's Christ's fault. It's not God's fault when I sin. The word justified literally means it's that judicial idea where the gavel comes down, boom, and it says, you're right in my sight. God's gavel comes down in the courtroom of, of humanity and he says, you're right in my sight. And uh, the idea, of, the idea of, uh, of justify comes from the idea of right and righteous. And God declares us right in his sight. In fact, Romans 5, 1 tells us, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know, every, every, everyone ever born is at odds with God because of sin. But when we're justified, we're made, we're declared right in his sight. That's where we stand. And so, uh, you know, the context here probably comes, we're still talking, Paul's still talking to Peter here, uh, and, uh, and, it's, and it's justification isn't through the law. That's what Peter's, that's where the, conflict was coming from the Jews here. And I, I think when Paul is talking here, I think he's, he's in the back of his mind. He's hinting at the idea that, you know, this sin, Peter, that we're talking about, this is your hypocrisy. You were sitting there so fine. You were enjoying eating at the Gentile table, and then you ran away when those from, Jew, the, from Judea came when the Jews came down, you basically put yourself and these Gentiles back under law. And so I think that's the sin that he's talking about is Peter's hypocrisy. And it, it just struck me. You know, from time to time, we're probably all hypocritical. From time to time, we probably all fail. And I know people say, oh, I'm not coming to church. It's just full of hypocrites. Well, come on and join the rest of us. You know, none of us are perfect. And we all act hypocritical at times. And, uh, but, but uh, notice he, he equates hypocrisy with sin. And it, and it just struck me a couple of verses that I thought of that in relation to this, that, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times I, I kind of 
I kind of justify my own hypocrisy and I don't count it sin. And a lot of times you, you've heard the idea of Christian sins, you know, that we, we're okay with certain sins, but not others. And the, the idea of hypocrisy here, and, it, and, it, and these verses that came to mind uh, that I was looking for, bo they ha both of these have in mind have in mind how my actions impact others, and God calls it sin. That's something to think about. I'm, so I'm not going to dwell on these, but I just want to tie in. Romans 14, 15 says, yet if your brother is grieved with your food, hmm, what was Peter's problem? Food. So these, both, both of these verses are in that category. You are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Wow. Christ died for them and you are messing with their, their spirituality by your food. That's what Peter did when he ran away from the table. But this one's more powerful, 1 Corinthians 8, 11. And because of your knowledge, the, because of your knowledge, hmm, what's knowledge? Knowledge puffs up, Romans 8, 1. Or 1, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. But he said, because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Oh, oops, excuse me, I went the wrong place. Yeah, oh no, that's right, that's right. That's just about like the other one, right? The other, he perishes, but I wanted to get to verse 12. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, conscience you sin against Christ. Wow. Anyway, we don't have time to go into that, into that deeply, but it just hit, it hit home to me that uh, how, how you sin against someone, you sin against Christ. Tough road we have. But anyway, so he says, is Christ the minister of sin? No way, certainly not, God forbid. And that word for the words that are put together there, it's, it's uh, literally the idea of, of the word no and the word be. Don't let it be. It's said in a prayerful manner. And uh, no wonder people, no wonder people say, uh, you know, where, where the translation is God forbid because it's almost like saying, it's blasphemy to, to blame God. It's like blasphemy to blame God for your sin. So don't be saying that. Don't let it happen. And then in verse 18, when he talks about if I build what I destroyed, well, what did Paul destroy? He destroyed his old legalistic law-keeping life. You read Philippians chapter 3, and he says, all that went before, even though I was a big wig in the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, he said, I count it all loss, I count it all dung for Christ, that I may gain Christ, and in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. Legalism gets in the way of knowing him. It ends up being, it ends up being, uh, being the thing rather than God being your focus. And so Paul says in this context, if I build what I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. I make myself a sinner. So what is he doing in verse 18? He's comparing Peter's sin and he says, if I would do this, if I would do what you did, Peter, I'm the transgressor. You can't blame God. I'm the transgressor if I would do that. And so he just putting it on the line, calling out Peter's hypocrisy. And then we move on to verses 19 and 20. And, and uh, you know, you know that I, I am a strong, I have a strong emphasis that we are under grace and not law. You know that, that my preaching is consistent in that way. We're under grace and not law, and, and uh, that's, where I, that's where I stand. But as you look at this, Paul is using the law here as an example. And he says, I, I died to the law. In fact, I'm going to read it for you again. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live unto God. Through the law and to the law. And the sense that he died, died to the law, I think I, it's just like 
Well, Paul was, leg- Paul was counting himself legally dead, counting himself legally dead, just like that preacher could say, no, no, you can't draft me again. Here's the death certificate. He died for me. Paul is saying that I am le- you, you need to count me legally dead, and I need to count myself legally dead. You need to count yourself legally dead, legally dead through what the law, the law requires. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then he's our substitute, and, and uh, you have died to the demands of the law. Everything the law demanded, just like, just like uh, and, and I probably should have brushed up my history a little stronger there, but people of a certain age in the, in the Civil War, they were eligible for the draft. That was the law. That was the law. But the exception was you could hire a substitute. And so the, the substitute was there, and, and Paul is saying, I have a death certificate. So how did Paul have a death certificate to the law? You know, years ago, <laughs> in our trip to Africa, uh, you know, I used, I used the idea of some of the Ten Commandments as, a, as an illustration. And uh, we, were, we had a, just a great time, but we're dealing with pastors and their wives, and I, and I was able to say, anybody here ever steal something? And just about every hand went up. Wouldn't yours? Anybody here ever steal something? Oh, quit. Some of you. Yeah, thanks, Dusty. I mean, I tell you. Dusty put up both. No, anyway. No. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I mean, we'd all admit that, right? And I, I don't know. I, anyway, this, this message was just going really well. And, uh, and I was better than here. No. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody raised their hand. Anybody ever tell a lie? Oh, yeah, everybody, you know. And I remember some of the things we did, you know. And, and, uh, and uh, I had to say, Mama Brooke. Uh, in, in Africa, they call, they call uh, Barb would be called Mama Brooke. But right from the front, I was able to say, Mama Brooke, hold on to your purse. We got a bunch of liars and thieves, you know. And uh, I mean, that just kind of, it just kind of blew them apart, you know. But, uh, you know, what is the, none of us have ever, none of us have ever fulfilled every point of the law. We might hit one once in a while, right? We might hit them once in a while. What are you laughing at, Fred? No. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I mean, None of us, I mean, we've all broken all of them. You know, we've all broken all of the, the commandments. And uh, if, it's, if not in person, in mind. Remember when Jesus said, it's about the mind? You know? How many, you know? Anyway. But he says, he says here, I died to the law through the very law for whatever the law demanded. And it has to come back to the person of Jesus Christ. And we can, we can say as our substitute, he died, he died in my place for everything the law held against me. Everything the law held against me, he took care of. And so the law, the, the law is never held against us. And I don't know what the worst thing you've done, and I don't want to know. But you know, our substitute took that to the cross. And so I died with with our substitute. And that's what that's what the the next verse goes on to say, but let me let me just hold on a little bit and come back to verse 16. In verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law except through the faith of Christ. Jesus Christ was the exception to anyone being right in the sight of the law. He was the exception. That's why he alone 
can be our substitute. There's never been anyone, anyone in human flesh who, ever, who has ever obeyed the law perfectly. And if, and if you'd have raised your hand like you were, like you were dishonest enough not to do, uh, <laughs> you know, we'd all have to say, we're lawbreakers. We broke them all. Or I think what I did in Africa, I had a little chain, paper chain, you know. If you break one, you're guilty of all. Yeah, James 2.10. You break one, you're guilty of them all. So anyway, Christ, Christ alone, he's the exception. And that's why we can say we can be justified, declared right through him. Because he was able to keep the law. So I, through the law, died to the law. And notice what it says in the last phrase here, that I might live to God. That's the point that he's making here. He is talking about everyday life for us. And he's saying, because we died to the law, because the law doesn't hold anything against us, then our life can be acceptable to God. I can live to God. If Christ is not your sacrifice, if Christ is not your substitute, if you don't have the death certificate, if it's not applying to you, then you cannot live pleasing to God. And that's why religion fails. Religion says, do this, do this, do this to get right. God says, you're right. You're right already. You're right in my sight, justified. Now, live up to that standard. I couldn't think of I couldn't help but think of Romans 12, 1 and 2 as we were as we were discussing a similar thing earlier this morning. I beseech you by the mercies of God. You ever moved by the mercies of God? That's what we're talking about here. Let the mercies of God grip you so that you present your body a living sacrifice to him that you can live unto God. And then look at, look at verse, look at verse uh, 20. And as, uh, as, we're, as we go there, think about the idea of religions. What do religions do? They create law. What did Christ do? He fulfilled the law. And the law has nothing against us today because we're in Christ. We're justified. We're right in his sight. We're, we're right in his sight because I have been co-crucified with Christ. I have been co-crucified. And I know that's probably not your translation. You probably have, I have been crucified with. But the, the, it's one Greek word there that all this comes out of. And it's a compound word, crucified with. I have been crucified with Christ. Huh. No wonder. And I know that's kind of a hokey drawing there, a little bit about, you know, me hanging on the Christ, cross with Christ. And, and maybe that throws you, I, I, I beg you that it doesn't throw you, but the idea that I have been crucified with Christ, I was there. You know, that old, that old tune, were you there when they crucified? I was there. No, not in person and in living. I was there having been crucified with him. I was co-crucified. His death was my death. I hold the death certificate. I hold the death certificate because my substitute paid my price, paid my penalty. I have been co-crucified with Christ. It's interesting, the grammar that's used there, the grammar that's used there talks about crucifixion being a one-time act, but the results continuing. The results having future impact. I, was, I have been co-crucified with Christ, and those results continue. That's eternal security. I've been crucified, and I continue to be crucified with Christ. It's settled. It's done. I have the death certificate from my substitute. My substitute died for me. And then he goes on and he says, he says, 
Christ lives in me. And let me, I can't remember if I put it in your notes or not. I, I guess I really didn't, so. But you know, I, I've seen, have you ever seen someone in a public place or carrying a big old clunky cross? Yeah. I remember the first time I saw that and I knew something was wrong. And I, and I, I, I learned from the guy that was doing it in a, in a public parade in our little town. And I learned from him that, oh no, he was carrying the cross because Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He was not, he did not understand salvation was by grace through faith. I think he was trying to earn it by carrying that cross. But anyway, that's not what this verse means when we said we've been crucified with Christ. This means we look back at what has been accomplished and we count it to be ours. We count it to be ours. And then he goes on, he says, Christ lives in me. And he, in other words, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ, my substitute, is living with it. I'm dead because of my substitute, but I'm also alive because of my substitute the death, burial, and resurrection. When you, when you try to sell, settle that all down, you know, the only life that we really have, the only life that counts is the life, it's his life. It's spiritual life from him. And he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Let me, let me back up and read that verse a little bit again for you. I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Now, that word flesh, maybe even after Sunday school lesson this morning, we might think, oh, that means the sinful fleshly life. Well, what he really means in this context is everyday life. When I go about my everyday life, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, who's living in me. And so, so don't get hung up with the word flesh there. It's just a reference to the idea of, of, the, of the everyday life. And I'll say, I'll say this, that you cannot live the Christian life. You've heard me say it before. You cannot live the Christian life. Because if you try to live it, it's coming from the wrong place. He says... The life is from Christ. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by the faith of him, his faithfulness. That's how we live this. But let's just think about our everyday life. How did your, how did your week go? Well, in the day that I was writing this portion of my message... I had an angry moment. And, uh, and I let the anger grip me for a moment. It was not righteous indignation. Okay? I had an angry moment. And uh, if you could have read my mind and seen my heart at that time, You'd have said, he better not be in the pulpit on Sunday. I mean, you know, if you, if you get down, anyway. But I cried out to God, and he changed my rotten tune to a good tune. You know, if we'd, if, if we'd examine our, our lives in light of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, you know, if we just live our everyday life and we, we leave God's life out of the picture, let's just read some of those things in Galatians 5. And it says, uh, and, and by the way, think in terms of, of mind as well. But he says, uh, the lust of the flesh are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, How many of you watched a TV show or an ad or a, something pops up on your computer or something that's, that leads you to wrong thoughts, sexual thoughts? 
They, you bump into them all the time, don't you? I mean, even a stupid advertisement on a good show, if there is such a thing. But anyway, uh, you know, but the, your mind can go. Idolatry. Have you really put something above, you know? Uh, he goes on. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy. Anybody angry over the political ads that are on TV? <laughs> Seen enough? Arr, you know. And then, the, and then what's the, my translation on the next one? Outbursts of, outbursts of wrath. Oh, boy. There I am. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. The like? In other words, this, this isn't all of them? No. It's anything like that. Anything where the flesh rears its ugly head and drags you away from the life that you have within. Distracts you from the life of Christ within. Distracts you from living to God. Wow. I love Romans chapter 6 in light of this whole thought here, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I want to, I want to just touch on verse 11. This is, the, this is the culmination of that passage. In Romans 6, 11, he says, Likewise, just like Christ who lives to God, and that's the previous verse, you also reckon, you count yourselves dead indeed to be sin. That's co-crucified. He mentions that in Romans 6, 6 too. Count yourself to be crucified. Now let me just make a statement there because you know what religion does there? Religion says, if you count it hard enough, then you can, then it's real. No, he's saying count the reality to be yours. Christ, you are crucified with Christ. You have the death certificate. He died in your place. Count that to be your reality. It's not that you try harder to reckon it to be so. He says, add it up. And the reality is, you have been crucified. So count yourself dead indeed to sin, but alive, co-raised, alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how we live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not my faith trying to make something happen. It's the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he takes us right back to the cross, and that's really what we're talking about the whole way here. Who loved me and gave himself for me. We are cross-connected. That's the point of this whole thing. We are cross-connected. When we live our everyday life, we're still cross-connected. That, and, and that's where we need to, that's what we need to think in terms of when I face this, am I living like I'm cross-connected or am I living like I'm disconnected from the cross? So this is about salvation and how to live the Christian life. God loved himself enough to give himself for us. And uh, the, the word used for for there, little four-letter Greek word, that just has the idea of on behalf of, in our place, in our stead, Christ loved us and gave himself on our behalf. He is our substitute. He was there instead of me. And Romans 5 uses this word four times in three verses. And uh, I'm going to read verse 6, 7, and 8 for you. And the first four is not that word for four. This is just a conjunction, but this other one. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, on behalf of the ungodly. In our, instead of the ungodly, Christ died. What does religion say? Oh, yeah, you shape up and become godly, and then, then the, Christ counts? No. Here I am. My, my rotten, sinful self. My ungodly. Christ died on behalf of me. 
Verse, uh, verse 7, for scarcely four or on behalf of a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps four or on behalf of a good man, someone would even dare to die. And I remember, I remember a story, Barb and I were talking the other day. I remember something from a, from a uh, Good Friday service when I was a kid. And this guy was a World War II chaplain. And uh, he, was, he was testifying. He said, yep, there was a sniper. And one of the guys saw the sniper aiming at me. And he jumped in front and took the bullet. And I, I just remember that from, I was, that's a long time ago. But... He, he did it for him, that idea. He said, yeah, for a good man, some might dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for, on behalf of, in our place. Wow. Religion twists it all around and makes it something other than what Paul calls it in the next phrase, in the next verse, he calls it grace. Don't displace grace. Paul says, so if he's still talking to Peter here, he's still, he's telling Peter, Peter, you're, you're running away, messed with the message. You drew some people in the wrong direction. You sent the wrong message. And so he, he said, but I've been crucified with Christ. I live and I live for him. And I don't displace grace. And that's grace for salvation. That's grace for Christian living. Because we're cross-connected. Grace keeps us cross-connected. Religion takes you away from the cross. Grace keeps you connected to the cross. That word for, I said, displace, that's literally the idea of the, of the Greek word there, no place. I don't displace it. Otherwise, what's the, otherwise, what's the solution? If grace is displaced, then Christ died for nothing. He died in vain. He died for nothing. I know at different times trying to share Christ with someone I've tried to make the point, tried to make the point that Christ is our substitute. He died in our place. And trying to make the point that, you know, if I'd, if I'd go and, uh, if I'd go take you over here, I'm thinking if like at the fair, for instance, as we're talking about, if I go buy you uh, whatever the yummy thing was right down, the, right down the street from where we were talking, if I'd go buy you a cotton candy, would you go insist and try to pay, pay, pay again? That's all religion can offer. It would really, it, it means that Christ would die in vain. It would mean that it's worthless. You're counting the death of Christ as worthless. The same thing in the Christian walk. Because our flesh can never please God, Romans 8, 8. Only God can please God. Oh, I, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I live, I live in his power. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Only Christ pleased God with his death and his life. I pray that you are cross-connected and that you can say, yes, I have the death certificate. He died in my place. He lives in me. Father, what an awesome truth that you have here. We pray that we wouldn't put religion in the way, we wouldn't put ourselves in the way, but that we would honor and magnify and glorify you and that our focus would be cross-connected, Christ-connected, Christ's life, not mine. And I pray that that these verses just sink home and be a reality in our daily walk, our everyday life, that we would live by the faith of the Son of God rather than our own efforts. We rejoice in you, Heavenly Father, for what you've done through the wonderful, your wonderful Son. Amen. Will you stand as we close?